Good morning again. If you have your Bibles, open them to Acts 28. Uh, we have arrived at the end. It has been a long journey, but I think it's been a good journey. But I was thinking about uh, what kind of the long haul of it all kind of feels like. And if you've ever driven from western Kansas into eastern Colorado, that, that 12-hour trip right there just kind of feels like, I'm just kidding, it's only like four, but it doesn't feel like it. But anyway, we've been going through this. It has been a great journey. I have learned a lot uh, through our study of Acts. I have grown in some areas in the study of Acts. Other areas have been, uh, had a light shone on them through the study of Acts for me. And again, uh, our study through it, our reading through it, the preaching through it uh, is not just for Sunday morning. It's meant to, for God to work on us throughout the week. Uh, again, nothing that I've said, uh, but what the Spirit is, is working on in your life uh, through what is being preached. So uh, we have come to the part where Paul is actually finally in Rome. We got there last week that he actually landed in Rome, but we're going to talk a little bit about the first half about what Paul is doing in Rome, what takes place in Rome, and then we're going to kind of do a quick, quick review of uh, a couple of things that we've seen throughout uh, the book of Acts. So before we get going too far, let's read. We're going to start in Acts 28, starting in verse 17. If you have your Bibles, open to that. If you don't have your Bibles, it'll be up there on the screen for you. But starting in verse 17, it says this. After three days, he called together the local leaders of the Jews, and when they had gathered, he said to them, Brothers, though I had nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. When they had examined me, they wished to set me at liberty, because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. But because the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar. Though I had no charge to bring against my nation, for this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you and speak with you, since it is because of the hope of Israel that I am wearing this chain. And they said to him, We have received no letters from Judea about you, and none of the brothers coming here has reported or spoken any evil about you. But we desire to hear from you what your views are, for with regard to this sect, we know that there, uh, everywhere it is spoken against. When they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in a greater numbers. From morning till evening, he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. And some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. And disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say, You will indeed hear but never understand, and you will indeed see but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes or hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, I would heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Let's pray. God, as we come to your word this, uh, today, as we've worshiped in song and in prayer and scripture reading, um, God, I pray that you would speak today. Uh, Spirit, I pray that you would actively move on those in this room as they hear the word. Um, and Lord, that you would reveal to them what it is uh, that you would have them to know and to learn and to grow from uh, your word and to, to become more like you for your glory. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. So Paul's in Rome. He's finally arrived in Rome. Uh, and he's actually given favorable conditions to live in. We see that he was given favorable conditions a little bit along the way. And now that he's in Rome, he actually gets to stay in a place that's not necessarily in the deepest, darkest jail cells. Now, he's still in chains, and he's still guarded by a Roman soldier. But he's, uh, he's kind of given a lot more liberty than a lot of people, probably because of the fact that the Romans don't even know, why is this guy even here? Remember, the whole way through, they're like, we don't find any fault with him, but the Jews kept pressing the issue, and so he kept appealing up the ladder and eventually gets to Caesar. So more than likely because they don't see him as a threat, and more than likely because of the trip and things that have happened along the way, 
the Romans give him a little bit more favorable conditions. And he, he explains to the Jews. The Jews come to him in a smaller number, and the leaders, and they say, they're kind of talking to him, and he's explaining why he's come this far. And it is amazing that no one coming from Judea, and no letters were sent about Paul saying, hey, this little rascal's coming your way. Uh, you might want to watch out for him. But they did know about the sect of Christianity that was kind of rising up, and amongst the Jews, this was an issue. And that's why they make their statements that they have. But they want to hear what he has to say. And so they're willing to hear him, as we see in verse 23, that they will appoint him a day. I hope by now that we find this humorous. They appointed him a day. Yes, Paul, all the rest of it was ordained by God, but these guys appointed you a day. From all eternity, God knew this day was coming, that he would stand before these people and give this sermon from, day, uh, from morning until evening. They appointed nothing to him. They got to do what God told them to do through whatever means, and they gave him this day, and he is going to speak. God, from all eternity, appointed him to speak on this day for these people to hear and do the same thing, basically, that Jesus did on the road where he goes all the way through the prophets and the Old Testament and the law, and he shows them. Because, again, in the Jewish culture, you didn't just go, well, the law says. If you could provide the law says and the prophet said and the word says, and you can show how all of it worked together to show one point and point to one thing, you would have a solid case. So it didn't just go to the law and say Jesus fulfilled the law. And he didn't just go to the prophets and go, these guys said some things about a guy who was coming, and this is Jesus. He showed from all of the Old Testament, all of the Psalms, all of the prophecies, all of the law, that all come together to a point in Jesus Christ. Again, I told you about the, the picture, the guy at the restaurant that's like, I want this. And when the food came out that looked exactly like the picture, he was like, nah, that's not the same thing. That's stupidity is what it is. And these guys are sitting here listening to the Old Testament, which they would affirm, we believe. And if Isaiah says it, we believe it. That's what their answer would have been. If Isaiah says this, then we believe that because he is an ordained prophet by God. And he goes, remember when Isaiah said this? Yes. They go, meh. It's amazing the fact that these guys keep rejecting what's laid out right in front of them. And Paul preached from morning till evening. Again, I don't want to hear about how long I preach, okay? He's already had a guy fall out a window because he preached so long, and then he brought him back. But then he preaches from morning all the way through evening, and these guys stayed and listened to it. And he preached from the context they would have known, and it should have gripped their heart. But it was more important to be Jewish and follow Jewish culture than it was to hear that the Messiah had actually come. It's more important a lot of times that I have my American culture than believe that the Messiah has come and I should live as the Messiah has called me. And again, I'm not poo-pooing on anything. I'm just saying, if you're more wrapped up in something that's unbiblical or something that's not rooted in Christ, then you are Christ, then we have an issue. It should be rooted in him. And like with any sharing of the gospel, some of it fell on good soil. It says that some believed. Some fell on the rocky soil and the seed was, uh, was not believed. It was disbelieved. And then we will also know that there's some of this that will land on good soil, but it takes longer for it to come to fruition. But the fact is that Paul was preaching the gospel to these people in Rome. The Roman church had already been established, but he's preaching to these Jews who are here and listening to what he has to say. So what's amazing to take place, what's amazing is how many guards, and, and this was brought up by somebody I was reading this week, and I actually thought, what an amazing thought. How many guards that were assigned to Paul will we see in heaven? These guys who by the governing officials were like, it is your day, you will guard this guy. And whoever was this guy this day stood there and listened to probably one of the best sermons we don't have the whole context of, but one of the best full sermons ever given. Number one, he had to stand there all day, so I'm sure that that wasn't his favorite. But number two, he heard the whole gospel. This guy had the whole thing presented to him. And over and over again, because he's there for two years, these guys would have heard the gospel preached over and over and over again. I don't know if we'll ever know, but I would love to know how many of these Roman guards appointed by Caesar's government to guard this prisoner ended up in heaven because of the gospel being preached around them. That is God's sovereignty. 
It is the same thing here in Rome and it's in other places. It drives the Jews away, though. Do you see that they like, we listen, they were in, some were convinced, some were not, but then they get real rowdy when he says one thing, which always makes the Jews rowdy. The gospel is for the Jews and the Gentiles. Brother, you do. No, no. It was never meant for them. But again, he shows them from Isaiah. It was meant for them from all along. It wasn't like Jesus came along and goes, nah, give it to the Gentiles too. That sounds good. From all eternity, God had planned to redeem to himself both Jews and Gentiles, people who were Jews and people who would be outside of that, even people who were, could be considered barbarians or the worst of the worst. Remember, there is no worst of the worst. I love how we like putting titles on things. Oh, those people, they're the worst. Well, God has redeemed even the deepest, darkest, worst people out of their darkness and sin. And I'm counting myself. Out of our sin to newness of life. Like, that's the point here. The gospel is for Jews and Gentiles. So despite the fact that they would have not agreed with Paul here, he, they could not disagree with Isaiah, yet they do because they walk away in anger that he would even suggest this. But praise God that it is for the Gentile because it is for us then. Praise God. And so despite the response, Paul gave, God gave Paul a platform for two years to continue preaching the gospel. He kept proclaiming, look at verse 31, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. The government didn't hinder him. In fact, they helped give him a platform to speak to these people and able to grow and share the gospel in Rome. What a phenomenal thing by God to use Paul in such a way. And again, God gave the platform. God gave the boldness. God gave the message. And then God saved the people. Paul was the instrument used by them, by him in this way. And this is not, and I, I may have given a wrong perspective last week. I don't know if I did or not. Maybe you didn't listen to that part. I don't know. I, I said that God was going to call Paul through all of this stuff and eventually to Rome to die. He doesn't die on this trip. He actually, by, by inferences that we have here, we see in Philemon that he says, I plan to come to you. We know that he actually will not die on this trip because he writes certain books or certain letters to the churches but we also know that other letters will be written after this because we get cities that were never mentioned in Acts and other places never mentioned in Acts. So he doesn't die on this trip. He never intended or never thought he would die on this trip. In fact, he knew he would be set free, and he will be set free, and he's going to go on another missionary trip. He's going to go on more things. He's going to share the gospel even farther, and he'll write even more letters all the way up to 2 Timothy. And then he's going to go on another missionary trip for about two years, and then he once again will be imprisoned. He'll be charged He'll be executed in about 8064. But Paul has much work to do here. And the fact is, is that God brought him all the way through. And we see all the way through Acts that God brought people to certain places and certain points. And some people he kept using and using and using until they got old and died. But most of these people that we see in Acts came to a certain point and they were called to their death for the gospel. There's so much assurance in my salvation for the fact of not anything that I've done but I find the assurance of my salvation in the fact of what Christ did. And then I can look at the word of God and I can go, look, God worked all these things out in this way. And then I can look at a guy who has everything to lose because he's got all the wealth, all the power, everything he ever wanted in Paul. Lays all those things aside as he meets Christ on the road to Damascus. And then as he lives his life out the rest of the time in complete hardship and horrificness and ends up dying for his beliefs... Nobody does that unless there's something that's genuinely happened in their life. This isn't a fancy, this isn't something that, you know, these guys got together and were like, hey, how about we make up this religion? There's so many concrete, evidential things that as we lay them out in front of the world, they're like, ah, not the same. But my prayer is, is that you, if you're in that place where you're like, ah, that you would lay that aside and say, is it true? And I've said that to many people. I said, study it. Well, if I go in there and I study it, I'm probably not going to believe it because I'll probably find that it's not true. I challenge you to study it. Read it. Look at the word of God. And again, though God will do the work on you. I'm not going to do any work on you. But if you just start reading the word, 
which again is one of my favorite stories because there's a pastor who was flying on, maybe I shared this one before, but he's flying on a, on a plane. This guy's like, yeah, I do this, this, and this. And he's like, the guy's like, what do you do? He's like, well, I'm a, I'm a preacher. He's like, which is probably not the thing on a long flight to share with somebody because usually people clam up, but this guy didn't clam up. He started to argue with the pastor and the pastor just started answering all of his questions and things. And there was a person to tell this story also that the pastor actually didn't share this story. It was the person that was in the seat next to them. And the guy kept going on and on about how it wasn't right. And the pastor kept sharing from the gospels and sharing from the Bible. And finally, they get to the point where the pastor shares. He goes, look, I'm, I'm never going to convince you. I don't think that I'm going to sit here and somehow share with you enough information. That you're going to go, aha, it really will only be by through the word of God and the work of the spirit in your life. But I challenge you, you live in the same city I do. Read the book of John and then come see me after you've read through the book of John. The pastor kind of forgot about, I guess, the conversation a little bit because he had had enough on his plate. And this guy came back, busted through his door of his office and into the church that he worked at, walked right past the secretary, according to the witness of this guy who was also on the plane, who was one of the pastors of his church. And he goes, how dare you? This is true. And got mad, but also Rick recognized that God is who he said he is, and I would have never known that had you not told me to turn to his word. That's the power of the gospel. And so under Caesar's nose, he is edifying and building the body. And under Caesar's nose, he is spreading the gospel. And many are coming to Christ in Rome. Whew. I got goosebumps. You don't have to, but that's the Lord, man. That... I get so energized looking at the fact that God does the work and that he works out these things for his will to move his church, to bring people to himself. And he's called us to be a part of that. So number two, what have we learned spiritually from Acts? And I can't exhaust this list. I hope, I hope your list is ridiculously long and my list is ridiculously long. Again, there's been things that God has worked on me. There's been blind spots where guys like, here and it's kind of opened my understanding to those things again nothing new theologically just I was missing it like I just for my own life I'm missing it and I'm still not there for some of these things but I see God working in my life but as we read through this one of the main things that we see throughout the entire book and I hope that you are reson that resonates with you and that it grips you about God's sovereignty and how as a believer that's a great thing I know that the world hates the idea, and I know that we wrestle with it because we wrestle with it through the things that we experience and we go through as finite people. But God's sovereignty is so beautiful. God's sovereignty is what saves. God's sovereignty is what works out his plan. God is sovereign and not reactionary. I would never worship a God who's reactionary. And if you've read a number of manuscripts from other religions, it's often reactionary. In fact, to the point where certain manuscripts have been rewritten up to five or six times because they had to react to what happened in the world going, well, well, what happened was, and what the Bible does is go, we've said it all along. I've worked it out from beginning to end. I am the I am. And this book has so many instances where we see the hand of God working things how he wants to work them. We see his sovereignty and the good things that happen. There's so many good things. We see his hand in the sovereignty of the things that are, look bad as far as worldly bad things that take place as well. And he's sovereign over both. We can't lose sight of the fact that God is still good, he's holy, he's perfect, he's righteous and sovereign in the good and the bad. And that's so hard for us. I'm not accusing anybody. Maybe there's a number of you in this room that are like, I struggled through the bad to see his sovereignty. We're human. But he is good in the midst of all of it. And God, through failed and sinful men and women, will grow his church. We saw miracles happen through the apostles' work. Again, they healed people, but knowing that it was not their own power, through the name of Jesus, stand up. Through the blood of Christ, this, it was always turning it back to the power, the will, and the authority of God. But he did great things through these people. We saw people survive trials that should have never survived the trial. John and Peter in Acts 4 was read earlier. They should have never survived that trial. The same guys who 50 days earlier put Jesus to death, they're now standing in front of going, you crucified him. 
That should have been their death. But God sustained them because his work was not done with them yet. We see an Ethiopian eunuch. Philip's not supposed to be on that road. Nobody goes on that road. And he says, Philip, go on that road. I got a guy out there. Wait for it. And he didn't even tell him. He's like, just go to this road. Okay. And he's standing on a road thinking, well, I'm on this road. And here comes this Ethiopian eunuch. Reading aloud the scriptures, and Philip's like jogging alongside. Hey, man, you know what that means? Well, how can I unless somebody explains it to me? Yeah, that, that was happen chance. That, that wasn't God. And then that guy is going to take the gospel to Ethiopia. Paul was brought to salvation. Paul was spared death multiple times. Thousands upon thousands of people will come to know Christ because of the work of these failed and sinful men and women. Again, because God is going to do the work because God is sovereign to save. And God also showed his sovereignty was in the bad too. We see he used Stephen mightily. Stephen's whole dialogue is one of the most amazing things. If you read it and you cherish it and you let it wash over you, you can't read Stephen's response and standing up to that trial and go, yeah, that's cool. It's beautiful. It's passionate. But it's all with the understanding that whatever happens, here's the truth. And he is stoned to death for it. God cares about how we worship him. He cares about our honesty. He cares about our honesty before him. He holds all life in his hands. And one of the hardest passages for non-believers to read in Acts is Ananias and Sapphira, who lie about what they actually had received and die for it immediately. He is God and sovereign in all. The second thing, as far as what we see spiritually, is that God gives the gift of the Holy Spirit. For those who were put their faith in Christ, we have one of the Trinity living inside of us. I don't know if that has fully encapsulated our minds, and I don't even think I could wrap my mind around it ever, and I don't know if we ever could. One of the Trinity lives inside of us and calls us to holiness. In fact, uh, we were at a the conference, and, and John Piper did a great sermon on the fact that we are called to holiness. It's very challenging, very good poke where I needed to be poked in a lot of areas, but we're called to holiness. You can't live in filth and not and have the Holy Spirit inside of you. If you think you're a believer and yet you keep living in filth and your life is filled with filth and everything about your life is filled with filth and you continue to live in the sin you're living in and there's no repercussions, there's nothing inside of you that says you should hate that. That's a problem. Because the, the spirit can't live in the filth and be okay with that. God is holy. He calls us to be holy. And so the spirit living inside of us can't do that. You can watch a pig roll around in mud all day. And that pig is happy to be in the mud. Children too. <laughs> but I was even just talking about this earlier this, with a couple of people. Like, I can't even go to bed with sunscreen still on me. Like, I don't want to lay on my sheets in that and then wake up in that. Oh, it's gross. People that do grow. Anyway, again, children. If you can, I'm not saying who's saved and not, but if you can and there's nothing inside of you that says, I hate that, you might want to start thinking about your salvation. And what a powerful gift that he gives. What a powerful gift this Holy Spirit is. Again, they're meeting together. They're in a 10-day prayer meeting. The Pentecost takes place. The Holy Spirit comes down on them. They're able to speak in different languages. That's what the tongue means. They're able to speak in different languages. And people are strolling around from all over the place, some from the farthest reaches of Africa, and they hear somebody talking in their language They're like, what? Nobody here knows that language. And the Holy Spirit does something incredible in a one-time instance to draw thousands unto himself. But then that power of the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. And again, we don't tap that at all. The power we receive from the Holy Spirit is rarely understood by most believers, including myself, to its fullest capacity. I'm not up here going, some of y'all got to figure out how to use this. Like, even in my own life, Romans 8.11 says, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, 
He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. The same power that rose Jesus from the grave lives inside of you today as a believer. What are you doing with that? The spirit moved and prompted the apostles and disciples movements. They were told to go here and they went there. They were led to do certain things. Again, Philip's carried out by the spirit. Paul's led by the spirit. Filled with the spirit, they said these things. The Spirit used unlikely men and women to further the kingdom. And the Spirit gave the courage to John and Peter in chapter 4. That's why they had the courage. Again, if you ever want courage to share your faith and live your gospel-driven life out, the courage comes from God. If your relationship with him has no connection whatsoever, there's no conversation, there's no prayer, there's no study of his word, and you go to do something, you're probably not finding the courage because it's not in you. But the Spirit gave the courage to John and Peter, and it says in uh, 4.8 that they, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, responded back to them. God did the work, no matter what the work was, through men, but for God's glory. And the last point that we learned as far as spiritually is that God saves, the gospel saves. It's both for the Jew and the Gentile. Jewish people did not like this idea, but the fact that God saved all. Even Jewish priests began to turn and follow Jesus, as we saw in Acts 6-7. That's a huge thing. These are the guys who have their lives set, and they're probably some of the lower priests, but it doesn't matter. Their life is set. Their track is set. They're, they're, they're good to go. They heard the gospel. The spirit moved. They responded, and they turned to follow Christ. They lost everything that they had worked their whole life for. What a picture. And then again, the shocker of the book and the message of the men who proclaimed it, beginning with Peter, is that the gospel is for the Gentiles too. He sees the, 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 the blanket come down. He sees the vision of the food. And he is told, none of this is unclean. And then he points him to a Gentile and says, here you go. And then had that vision not come, he might have said, I'm not supposed to tell them. They're not part of this whole deal. But because of that, we see Roman centurions, we see Roman soldiers, we see Roman citizens, we see other people come to know him. And despite the anger by the Jews towards this, what a gift of grace that it was for all, that is, receive it. And the power of the gospel radically changed lives. Paul's life is radically changed. Roman soldiers are radically changed. Roman centurion and his family come to Christ. You have women who are meeting together in this Jewish circle who don't know Christ. The gospel is shared with them and they come to know Christ and will start a church in their area. Priests, apostles and disciples, whole cities. These men who have turned the whole world upside down as 17.6 says. These dudes that are turning the world upside down, they're here now. All for the glory of God. The gospel changed lives and the last full point is what we learned for the church and i'll work my way through these two things quickly but we as believers should learn from these men and women in acts as well first their devotion to prayer first their devotion to prayer the beginning of acts before pentecost starts begins with a 10-day prayer meeting they meet together they're in a room they're praying fervently 114 says they devoted themselves to prayer we read the word devoted and we're like, well, I'm devoted to some stuff. That's not what the word in the original language means here. It means that they were deeply entrenched in prayer. That's a different thing. I pray every day. Am I deeply entrenched in prayer, though? Rarely. This is a deeply entrenched prayer. It was their lifeblood. Every time a major event occurs or the disciples, apostles went before a council on trial or something was going to happen or a major movement took place, they devoted themselves to prayer. While in each city in their churches, they devoted themselves to prayer. In the midst of calamity, in the midst of the storm in the boat, Paul's like, let's pray. In the midst of great things taking place and thousands coming to Christ, they devoted themselves to prayer. The conditions don't determine our prayer life if we know who the source of the answer is personally. The conditions of our life don't determine our prayer life if we always know the source and answer personally. What I mean by that is this. 
I don't have to wait for things to get bad to go to him. If I know him personally, I have a relationship with him at all times. I know fundamentally that he knows where I'm going and where I'm at and what I'm struggling with. I know fundamentally that he goes with me. And I know that he is the answer to all of my prayers, even if the answer to my prayer is my death and calling me home. Who wouldn't want to talk to God Almighty if we really understood who God Almighty was? Who wouldn't, who wouldn't pray without ceasing when they truly understand who God is? Things don't have to be good or bad. He is the I am. That's what's rested on me this week for some reason over and over and over again. I want to know him more. And we as a church and as individual believers need to understand why prayer is important. It's not just something we do. And we need to learn what it means to pray fervently and pray big. I think sometimes we think that praying big is, is not what we're supposed to do. Nah, 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 that's not really, God has called us to pray. In fact, in the Old Testament, he says, never stop calling on my name. He wants to hear our prayers. And the second thing is radically important as well, and that's discipleship. I feel the church in America is the mighty Casey at bat. Sorry for a baseball analogy if you're not a baseball fan, but it's what you get with me. Where and when it counts the most in discipleship, we strike out. I don't even feel like we're even fouling off pitches. You know, when somebody keeps fouling off pitches, you're like, all right, way to go, stay alive. Way to stay alive. I think we're just missing. I think we strike out in the idea of what it means to disciple other people. And our attempts to disciple are usually fledgling at best. And we're not even making contact with people, literally, that we should be discipling with our lives. I mean, we're commanded to go make disciples. We're not commanded to go just tell people about Jesus. We're commanded to go share the gospel. But we're going to go make disciples, true disciples, true followers of Christ. And we used to do it all the time, and I, I think it's a frustration that... We used to dunk them and ditch them. Hey, you're in the group. Figure out how that works. You ever been into, invited to a new group of people? Or maybe you moved schools when you were in high school and everybody else has their friend groups. You're like, no. We do that in the church. You're in. Okay, what do I do? Who do I hang with? Instead of going, come with us. All of us, each believer in this room, you are to be making disciples. You should have a desire to be discipled and honest discipleship. And what I mean by that is no coffee dates. If your discipleship is only a coffee date with your buddies, lady friends, whatever it is, are you really working on discipleship? Are you talking about things at that point that if the people at the table next to you heard your honest, open prayer requests, honest, open struggles and needs, that they might go, what? We should all be fully known by somebody who can call us to an account in our lives. And you should have someone or multiple of someones in your life that you are discipling as well. Parents, we're the number one disciple maker of our kids. We know that. But we need other people to help us with that. We need other people to walk alongside us with our kids to help us disciple our kids. The children's ministry uh, is, is a place that we need more people to serve in because we need more people to come alongside the kids. And men, my kids walk out of there every time they get a chance to hang out with Dave Sitz and go, Dave was awesome. They love him. Dave's the most laid back dude ever, though. I walk by that room and he's like, yeah, guys. And I'm like, some of them need to sit down. But they love him because he knows how to engage with them, how to talk with them. They love having that relationship. Discipleship. Come alongside the parents. Walk with us. Walk with us and our kids because the world is trying to disciple our kids all the time. We need church people who are just as willing to jump into the fray with us and disciple. And here's something. Answer to yourself honestly. Who are you discipling? Who have you ever discipled? This is for you, for your own engagement, for your own thinking, for your own processing. Why don't we feel the need to be actively engaged in discipleship? 
If your answer to who have I ever discipled is no one, guess what? You still got breath in your lungs. God is still calling you to this. You still have the opportunity. This isn't me going, this is me saying, answer the call. The call is for you. And the church is failing in a lot of areas. We are seeing people walk away in droves because of a lack of discipleship. There's no engagement. There's no relationship. There's nothing with depth that I wants to draw me back there. And we're also seeing weak churches with weak believers because of a lack of discipleship as well. People are unwilling to walk alongside someone who has come to Christ and go, Here are the, here's the things that are true about God and his word. And so what we end up happening is that these believers start going off and they start hearing these guys who seem dynamic, not dynamic, who seem dynamic, who are saying all these crazy great things, but if you ever held what they said up to the word of God, you go, that doesn't match. This isn't the word of God. And we got to know that stuff. And so instead of our people being on spiritual milk, we need to raise them to be on the meats and then they can turn around and disciple someone else to discern what is right and what is wrong as well. And eat meat. I mean, the mark is set before us. We aim this year as a church in leadership. Jake and I have put it on our hearts. Our elders have put it on their hearts that we aim to grow in our discipleship here and to help you grow in your discipleship as well. I mean, don't glide through this world never posing a threat to the enemy because you are too busy with non-eternal things. And I've set a challenge for myself. I already have two people that I disciple. I meet with, we talk through things. I've got a person who disciples me as well. But I have given myself the challenge to add two more people to my discipleship this year. And you're like, two, that's a low number. When you understand discipleship, that's a good number. (laughs) Jesus had 12 and he was the son of God. I'm going to aim for two. (laughs) All right. You're with me. So I'm going to add them in. My challenge is that you would look for, take seriously, and start pushing into and discipling people as well. Well, they've got, they've got their parents. Trust me, the parents need you. Take this seriously and join us as we take another step toward who God has called us to be. If we really want to be a multi-generational church, it does start with outreach and evangelism to get people to come, but it will die without the gospel and discipleship. People will walk through the door for anything. We can hold a big carnival out there, call it Pumpkin Palooza, and get lots of people to show up and shoot off cannons and do all. Like we do some fun stuff. It's awesome. But if we get them only with that, then they're going to assume that that's how we're going to try and keep them. And when that fun turns to formative when we share the gospel, if there's no relationship and depth behind it, they disappear. So real quick, finish this with this. Acts study. This has been a good study for us. It has pushed us, for the, and for the times we live in, we've had a good example of how to live in the times that we live in by these men and women who stood firmly in the gospel. We had intended actually to go another direction. Patrick and I had decided we were going to do Daniel. And we were like, Daniel will be a great study. And then God just kept laying on my heart, Acts. And he kept calling me to Acts, and he kept showing me Acts, and I kept having people talk about the book of Acts, even in our own church. I'm like, okay, Lord, the book of Acts. And I think that it was absolutely where we needed to be. I mean, I'm glad I'm finishing the book, but don't want us to lose sight of what God has taught us and what we've read. I want to apply it to my life, and I want to see you do the same. Not because I said so, and not because, well, we preached through it, so don't let it go to waste. But because he is the Lord. This is his word. He has given us a call. He desires to see you grow. He's calling you if you're unsaved to himself and that you can trust and believe because we know that he is the truth. In God you will find life and he grows us through the right application of his word in our own lives. And I pray that we're doing that through the word of God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you, God, for today. Again, we thank you for your word. Lord, again, I trust that it's more than just um, me up here. I know, Lord, that it comes from you. I know, Spirit, that any power or any change or anything that's resonated with anybody comes from you. Um, Lord, I just pray for your glory and your glory alone. Um, The hearts and lives would be changed. If someone is here and doesn't know you, I pray, God, that they would begin to realize, or maybe they're at the point where they finally are going to just lay down all the things that they've been holding so tightly to and realize it's the truth. 
I need you, Lord. And Lord, if there's people in this room who have been kind of drifting along but are realizing the call to discipleship or the call uh, to live out in a fervent way their, 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 their relationship with you, I pray, God, that they would take that seriously. They wouldn't let that die, that they would uh, pursue it and pursue it hard and take people along with them as well. And Lord, whatever's done, we pray that it honors you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, Won't you stand with us? I was uh, thinking about the book of Acts and just uh, the.